Okay, Year 11, you've got less than 24 hours before your final GCSE Science exam, so what are you doing right now? Hi, my name's Dr De Bruin. I'm a GCSE and A-level science teacher, and I'm here to tell you about the 27 biggest mistakes that you need to avoid in GCSE Physics Paper 2. If the force is acting on an object to unbalance, then that's going to cause the object to accelerate. But if the force is acting on the object are balanced, that doesn't mean it's stationary. It means that its velocity is constant. Imagine you're riding your bike. If you pedal harder, then you speed up. If you brake, then you slow down. If your thrust is equal to the drag forces, then you're not stationary, you're just going at a constant speed. Number two, DT and VT graphs look very similar to me. Double check the y-axis before you start answering any questions. If it's a distance time graph, then a diagonal line would mean a constant velocity. Whereas if it's a velocity time graph, then that same diagonal line would mean constant acceleration. Three, stopping distance is breaking distance plus thinking distance. And if you're writing about the time taken to stop, what's wrong with you? Well, I kill people and eat their hands, that's two things. If they ask about distance, tell them about distance, but also remember that reaction time is a time. Breaking distance will be increased by wet or icy weather, but you have to say wet or icy, you can't just say the weather. Likewise, poor tyre condition, poor brake condition, not just the condition of the car. If speed increases, then the kinetic energy of the car also increases. But remember that EK is half mv squared. So this means that the impact of speed on braking distance is not going to be linear. For the spring extension required practical, you need to be plotting extension, not length. So first you need to calculate extension by comparing the initial length of the spring and the length after you've added the masses to it. Remember, you can also do this experiment in reverse with a spring which you squash, and then you would still need to measure the initial length and the final length. When you reach the limit of proportionality, if you've plotted force on the x-axis, then your graph is going to kick straight up. But if extension is on the x-axis, then your graph is going to kick to the right. Before you reach the limit of proportionality, your spring will go back to its original shape when the force is removed, and an inelastic object will return to its original shape when the force is removed. Number nine, when you move from a rough surface onto a smooth surface, friction is reduced, but it doesn't go away completely. Actually, most of the big mistakes in physics paper two aren't about physics, they're working scientific. So number 10, the resolution of your equipment is the smallest difference that you can measure. So it's probably going to be one degree Celsius or one degree on a protractor or one millimeter on a... But actually for something like a digital thermometer, it could be 0.1 degree Celsius. So just figure out what is the smallest difference that you could detect. 11, you're not going to get the right answer if you don't put the right units in. So make sure that all of your lengths are converted to meters and all of your masses are converted to kilograms. Number 12, sorry maths department, but a line of best fit does not have to be a straight line. So if your data curves, then your line of best fit should curve. 13. Make sure that your scientific calculator is set to degrees mode, not radius, especially if you were doing further maths last week. Number 14. Did you know that a protractor is actually a required piece of equipment for physics paper 2? It's very hard to do reflection without it, and it's impossible to do resolving resultant force diagrams without it. The delta sign, which looks like a little triangle, means change. You've met it in specific heat capacity in unit 1, but actually last year they used it for delta y and delta x on a graph. Accurate, precise, repeatable, reproducible and uncertain all have real meaning. They don't just mean good or bad. Your data are accurate if they're close to the true value. They're precise if there's a very small range around the mean. And if that spread of readings around the mean is very small, you're also going to have a very low uncertainty. Repeatable means that when you do the same experiment again, you see the same pattern. Whereas reproducible means that following peer review, some other scientists using a similar method also see a similar pattern. When you're measuring wavelength, go peak to peak or trough to trough. You can go midpoint to midpoint, but it is way too easy to accidentally label half a wavelength. And amplitude is half of the maximum displacement, so it's only half the height of the wave. Despite how it looks on an oscilloscope, sound is a longitudinal wave. Remember, push, pull, sound and longitudinal all have U's in them. You should be able to define transverse and longitudinal, and not just transverse means it goes up and down, and longitudinal means it goes push and pull. A transverse wave is one in which the particles oscillate perpendicular to the direction that the energy is going. And then longitudinal is the same but parallel. You need to answer in terms of oscillation and energy transfer. Number 20, the normal is an imaginary construction line that we draw in radar graph, and it's drawn at 90 degrees to the surface that you're measuring against. And when you use it to measure your angle of incidence or your angle of reflection or your angle of refraction, you're measuring between the ray and that normal, not between the ray and the surface. Because otherwise, why would the normal even be there? 21, I hope you've been practicing your song and you know the order of the electromagnetic wave. But you should also know that for visible light, the longest wavelength is going to be red and the shortest wavelength is going to be violet. The clue being that they're next to infrared and ultraviolet. You know about the ripple tank required practical, but did you realise there's a second part to that practical? You also need to investigate a standing wave on a string and how changing the frequency of that wave affects its wavelength. The only metallic elements that are magnetic are iron, cobalt and nickel. A compass points north because it aligns itself with the Earth's magnetic field. 
Number 25, when you're using Fleming's left hand rule, then your second finger stands for current. But remember, that's conventional current, which is not the same thing as the direction that electrons move. And last but not least, new elements are formed in stars as a result of nuclear fusion. But elements bigger than iron can only be formed as part of a supernova. Good luck for the exams, guys.